Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the new Civil Liberties Alliance. Today's Lunch and Law program is entitled, Can Relentless and Loper Bright Kill Chevron Deference? Um, and uh, I'm John Vecchioni, uh, Senior Litigation Counsel here at NCLA. And I'm joined by two guests uh, who know this topic well. To my immediate left is Carol Rollins, who uh, was counsel on this case from complaint uh, all the way to the Supreme Court. And she's litigation counsel here at NCLA. And to my far left is Roman Martinez, a partner at Latham and Watkins uh, with considerable um, experience arguing before the Supreme Court and a great choice to argue that case, which he did last week. Um, I'm gonna give a brief synopsis. I, I assume that everyone in the room and those watching uh, have some idea about what this case is about, so I'm not gonna give the full bell and whistles, but just if you're joining us, I'll give you some idea about what we're talking about. Um, we had the case Relentless v. Commerce, and our friends at Cause of Action had the case Loper Bright versus Romando. Both cases involved herring fishermen who um, the agencies that sort of govern fishing in the United States uh, issued a regulation that at sea monitors who would come on their boats and check that they're following the fishing regulation size and what kind of fish and that sort of thing would be paid for by the fishermen rather than by the government. And since the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, which governs this area of law, was um, amended in 1990, they, ha they had to take observers on their boats when the agencies wanted them to. But 20 years later, the agencies decided with no uh, no textual um, support in the statute to have observers or at-sea monitors paid for by the fishermen up to more than $700 a day um, to basically watch them and, and, and be their monitors uh, that they had to pay for. So this wasn't in the statute. So we brought a case, Cause of Action brought a case, saying you have to follow the law and not what the administrator wants. Uh, and what we ran into, both, both of us ran into, one in uh, Rhode Island in the First Circuit and one in D.C. District Court and Appellate Court was the Chevron Doctrine. And this is the doctrine that when statute is silent or ambiguous, the courts have to follow the reasonable construction uh, and, uh, of an agency that governs it. So should that be what happens or should the courts say what the law is? Um, obviously, you know my view, but I have, um, I have two people here to talk about this because we did have the oral argument last week, and I thought I'd, I'd start um, with Roman, uh, and we just go through each justice and the type of questions they asked and what their concerns were and what we thought. So, Roman, you were, uh, you were up there. Uh, <laughs> what was your impressions of where they were and, 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 uh, and, and what kind of questioning you got? Thanks, John. Um, well, first, let me just say uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today and also a pleasure to work with NCLA, with John and Kara and Mark Chenoweth and uh, Philip Hamburger on this extremely interesting and important case. Um, this is, uh, you know, I've, I've argued in the court before, but this is definitely, it was maybe the most fun and interesting argument to prepare for and, and one of the most challenging. Uh, we're seeking to overturn a longstanding precedent of the court there's, uh, there's the justices, this, they're not coming at it uh, fresh in the way they are with a lot of issues that get to the court because a lot of them have thought about and written about this issue and written law reviews about this issue uh, over the years. About Chevron deference. About Chevron Not herring deference. fishermen. Not herring <laughs> fishermen, exactly. <laughs> Chevron deference is something they've all thought a lot about. Um, so I think in general, and I'm happy to talk about individual justices, you know, as you like, I think in general, you know, the court was extremely active and interested in the issues. They heard, you know, back-to-back -back arguments in the two cases. The arguments lasted, I think, about three and a half hours, three hours, 40 minutes, somewhere thereabouts. Um, our case took about two hours and 15 minutes. We were allotted one hour, and they ended up taking two hours and 15 minutes. I think I was up there for almost an hour, hour and 15 minutes just in my opening presentation. So that, I think, was a sign that they were extremely interested. In general, I got questions, uh, as expected, some very tough questioning, like right from the get-go from the, uh, the more liberal wing of the court, um, questions that seem to suggest that they may have a hard time agreeing with our position, um, which isn't entirely surprising given the way that, um, that those justices uh, 
you know, I've talked about Chevron in the past and talked about deference doctrines in the past. I think from the right side of the court, I think we had a number of justices that seemed to be uh, asking questions that were premised on, you know, in a favorable way uh, and maybe suggesting they're well disposed to our position. And that's consistent with some of their writings in law review articles and also in prior decisions. Uh, I think the, the two justices that maybe were seen by commentators as perhaps being in the middle of the court on this issue, um, or at least with less to go on in terms of their views, the Chief Justice and Justice Barrett, I think both had good questions and tough questions for both sides. Um, you know, the Chief Justice seemed to be focused on, you know, to some extent on some practical questions on, uh, about how, uh, how important Chevron is, given that the court has not relied on it for many years. Um, I don't know exactly what the premise underlying that question was. It may be that it's okay to overrule it because it uh, it hasn't you know it hasn't we've sort of overruled it in practice. It may be that we don't need to overrule it because we've overruled it in practice and it's not a big uh, a big issue anymore. And then Justice Barrett, I think, had interesting questions both about the theoretical foundations of Chevron, um, mainly I think directed towards the Solicitor General and sort of pushing on whether Chevron's premises are right are correct. But then also some tr uh, tough questions for us about what the consequences of over overruling Chevron would be and how disruptive it would be for prior decisions. So happy to say more about those justices or others, but at, at a high level, I think um, we got what we wanted, which was a really fair, thorough hearing mm -hmm. from the justices where all the hard issues were vetted. And I, I think we had a chance, and Paul Clement arguing on behalf of the petitioners in the other case, had a chance to really put forward our, our best theories of, of the case. And I'll get, I'll get to the individual justices, but you were also there. Mm -hmm. What were your impressions? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things, and this is sort of playing on something Roman remarked about, is that there was a sense of the court saying, well, we just haven't applied this in a long time. Why are we here? And I think that these cases really illustrate the problem, certainly among the district courts, certainly among the courts of appeal. Chevron is still being applied. Um, these courts are indicative of it, but I know Justice Gorsuch referenced immigration, veterans, and Social Security cases. Individuals and, and small businesses bump into Chevron all the time. And so whatever the court may think is happening in front of them, I think that there is a, an acknowledgement from the parties saying, you have one view of this, and certainly among amici, I think at the cert stage for Loper Bright, this is something that got really teased out, is that you court thinks something is going on here that is not the reality on the ground. And I think that, you know, I was happy to see that that question only came up a couple times and they were really engaged with sort of the, the nuts and bolts of what this is, what potentially comes next. And you've brought it up, but I, but I know Roman's also familiar with the Buffington case. And in that case, uh, Justice Gorsuch said that, that, that Chevron isn't used a lot. And the amici in Loper Bright, the friends of the court briefs in Loper Bright, were unanimous, including me. Uh, we we put in we have put in an amicus brief in Loper Bright, and then we argued for it. But we said that look, this is not. I don't know what's happening in the Supreme Court to make you think that this isn't used all the time, but it is used against um, American citizens constantly. And I remember uh, we put in the Buffington cert. We, we quoted Gorsuch and said that he was completely wrong. And we put a footnote, even Homer nods, because we didn't want to, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I, th I think that that issue is, is, is interesting because, you know, a lot of times the court is able to kind of resolve the individual case that comes before it. Mm -hmm. And not, you know, when, whether Buffington, they denied cert. Um, there have been a, a couple of other cases that have come up relatively recent years where Chevron has been directly implicated below. And often in those cases, the U.S. government, the government agencies litigating below, um, you know, rightly from their perspective, invoke Chevron because it's the law. Mm -hmm. And they make a, a strong pitch for Chevron deference. Often they get it and then they win under Chevron deference. And then the case gets to the Supreme Court and the other side is, is like, well, you should overturn Chevron. Look what it's doing. And then the government's like, well, you know, we don't really need Chevron to win this case. And they kind of downplay Chevron mm -hmm. once it gets to the Supreme Court. And, the, and there's a little, and I, I, I don't mean to cast aspersions on my old colleagues and my friends in the Solicitor General's office, but there's a little bit of a, a bait and switch type maneuver that sometimes happens um, when the cases get to the court. So there've been a couple cases, we talked about them a little bit at argument, the American Hospital case a couple of terms ago. I, I brought up a case called Digital Realty um, from you know six, seven years ago 
where uh, you know the court ends up unanimously concluding that the statute unambiguously supports the citizen against the government. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, the lower courts had applied Chevron mm -hmm. and come out the other way. And to me, those those cases just sort of illustrate like if, if the lower courts are are you know applying Chevron and coming to the wrong result, I think that's a pretty good sign that something needs to be fixed here. And hopefully we were able to get that point across at the argument. Yeah, I think that that goes to the workability question, which is one of the stare decisis factors, right? Like, is Chevron workable? And I think, Ramon, you said something in argument of like, we keep tacking these things on. And in my mind, I keep thinking of like the Beverly Hillbillies truck, right? Is that thing road legal anymore? And I think the answer is no. Um, because if you have to keep modifying, if you have to keep adding, you know, step zero, step 1.5, all these, variations, um, you know, is it workable? I think the answer is very clearly, no, it's not workable. Yeah, I think that was a really important theme just to just to kind of explain it a little bit more that came up at argument, you know, because one version of the question that we got, including from some of the, the more liberal justices maybe predisposed to try to shave, save Chevron, was like, well, can't we just sort of clarify it a little bit more and narrow it a bit at the margins? And to me, that's sort of what the court has been trying to do in various ways in recent years. Um, you know, going back even to Mead, the Mead case, which imposes a, what, what's now known as step zero, you basically have to, uh, you, to apply Chevron, the agency has to be acting with the force of law in, in a very formal way. Um, then the court in the Kaiser case um, made clear that the step one analysis of whether the statute is, is ambiguous really needs to be a very robust inquiry at step one. Um, then the DC Circuit has this doctrine, step 1.5, where the agency only gets deference if they know that the statute is ambiguous. If they think it's clear, but it's actually ambiguous, then you need a remand to figure out whether the agency would come out differently if they knew it was ambiguous. Um, I've never been able to make heads or tails of what, because doesn't the agency just go back and say, ah, oh, yes, it is ambiguous. Yeah, it's, right? it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit, it's strange because the, actually, the agency could actually correctly identify the best view of the statute, but mm -hmm. because they wrongly thought it was clear instead of ambiguous, in theory, that means they have to go back for a remand, even though they were right about the law. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And then the Kaiser case itself sort of imposes this, I, I started calling it step three, sort of at the end of the process, you then look at, at whether the agency is flip-flopped and whether the agency is acting in an area where it has expertise, and maybe you turn off Chevron deference there, and then you've got the major questions doctrine. But all these things are kind of like Band-Aids. They're sort of addressing the symptoms of the problem. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that you have a doctrine that really doesn't make a lot of sense in the first place because it, it takes away these, this you know, judicial authority over interpretive questions, over questions of law, mm -hmm. and hands it over to agencies, and thereby incentivizes, I think, agency bad behavior because they think agencies start to think that they're not actually bound by the real law. They're just bound by uh, you know, their own policy. Once they're in a zone of ambiguity, then they can just do policy. Even if it's manufactured ambiguity. Yeah, right. and I think you know, when you're asking about you know, what were the concerns of some of the justices, I think certainly Justice Jackson had this you know, point on, and I think this is playing off of some Justice Kagan's earlier questioning too, of like, where is the line between interpretation and policy making? And I think you know, that's a that's a completely fair inquiry. I think that it ignores some key concerns about Chevron overall. I think it goes into without folks maybe necessarily realizing it, the way people view power and government structure, and say the role of experts in this whole thing that has gotten its way in, as opposed to going back and looking at what is the structure set up by the Constitution. And, and I, think, I think that was the argument. I mean, sitting on the sidelines, it did look like uh, Kagan and Gorsuch were having that exact discussion, <laughs> to, 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 to tell you the truth, and, and uh, you were like a bystander to some extent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried to weigh in a little bit. I mean, I thought, I thought you know, some of these questions got very deep in, into the theoretical realm. And I think, you know, Justice, I had an exchange with Justice Jackson that I thought was revealing, maybe on both sides, mm -hmm. um, where she was asking, you know, she sort of had, seemed to have a vision that at a certain point, some of these statutory interpretation questions really are just like turn into pure policy mm -hmm. questions. And at one point she asked me almost like incredulously, like whether my view was that every question of statutory interpretation is a legal question. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> like that, that is like exactly <laughs> yeah. where my view is because I do think that there's a division between law and policy. I think courts have the duty to exercise independent judgment and say what the law is. We know that right. from Marbury versus Madison. I think it's, it's very implicit in the structure of the Constitution. 
It's core to the judicial power. It's reflected mm -hmm. in the Administrative Procedure Act. And I think in every other context, you know, any statutory interpretation question would be thought of as a policy, as a, a law question, a question of law. And but but Jackson very like, you know, it was not like this was some secret um, view of the law. She was very kind of mm -hmm. surprised that that was, you know, our position. I think she had just a very different view that at a certain point, it's really just all policy, which maybe just reflects a difference in underlying views about like what law is. And she and she does. You know, we had a case cause of action called Limnia where the, the question was whether the agency had had treated this um, this company looking for an energy subsidy uh, fairly. And uh, she remanded it to the agency for a do over. And um, and uh, she was reversed by the D.C. Circuit because they said they didn't say they were going to do anything different. Mm -hmm. But she did have kind of a view that the agency, once she told them what they're supposed to do, they were going to do it. And right. I, I do think she 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 believes that. But um, before well, and I think I was Go gonna ahead. say an overly simplistic way that I've started thinking about, like where this line is, is if it's the question that's being asked is, can we do it? Right. That's question. That's a question about agency power. Was the agency empowered to how we do it or how should we do it is a policy question. And I think that for those out there who might come more from the politics policy realm, that line is a little bit more obviously than the, the legal realm. And I think there are areas where it starts getting close, but that's certainly like my very simplistic view of where I think the line may actually exist is if it's about power and can we do it, that is a, that's an interpretation question left to the courts. If it's about how we should do it, that's a policy question, I think. And there's going to be marginal cases on either end. So this, uh, what both of you have said brings me to um, questions I didn't know I was going to ask, but I'm going to ask this. So. Ramon, why do you think that in both in Buffington, Gorsuch said, oh, it's not really used much anymore. And Roberts implied to you when he was asking you the question that it's not really used much. Do they think that it's easier to get rid of if they say it's not being used contra what all the uh, Amici believe? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I don't pretend to know sort of what was motivating or what understanding underlay those comments. I think with respect to the chief justice, I think the chief is, is, you know, very cognizant of the institutional role of the court. I think he is rightly um, very sensitive to and thinks very deeply about hard questions about overruling precedent. And I think he is right to think that precedent should be taken very seriously and should only be overruled in, in really important situations where it's necessary to do that. And so I think if he thought that, um, that Chevron didn't really matter that much anymore, maybe because courts weren't applying it as frequently or the applications of it that were out there weren't that problematic. I think that would weigh in his mind as a reason why we don't need to kind of, you know, unsettle the doctrine by overruling it. I think, though, that, that, that the challenge for the justices is, you know, they're, they're taking, you know, 60, 55 to 65 cases a year, only a handful of which sort of potentially implicate Chevron. And they have the ability in those cases to just resolve the case on non-Chevron grounds and kind of say, you know, we hope lower courts are applying step one rigorously so we don't need to defer because you're doing statutory interpretation. I think what they don't see is that, you know, in, in many other in many cases, the lower courts are just not quite doing it that way. And that's why you get decisions in the First Circuit and in the D.C. Circuit like we got in, in the two cases that were argued last week. And you bring something up that reminds me uh, of Keflage. Mm -hmm. And I know you were looking at Keflage before we had this. And Ramon said at uh, oral argument that uh, p people like Judge Keflich said they never used, never gotten a step two in Chevron. And uh, Judge Silberman says, ah, 90 percent of these things is am are ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And I think you had a quote from Keflich. Well, yeah, I was preparing for something else. And oh, we were man. talking about deference. But we had this great Keflich quote that I said to John. I said, I got to dust this one off because it was on the question of exhaustion of um, statutory tools, you know, tools of construction. And he said, federal courts have become habituated to defer to the interpretive views of executive agencies, not as a matter of last resort, but first. And I think that the some of the justices pulled on this theme of this concern that because Chevron exists, the courts themselves don't have to do the hard work. I think Justice Kavanaugh was really sort of digging at this, this exact point in some of his questions. And, and Roman said that, I, I think, almost exactly. And, and I think it's true, but there's another question. So I've asked about uh, Roberts and, um, and Gorsuch, because I'm not sure how, why they asked that, and that, that they both did it in different cases at different times is kind of weighing on my mind. But the other one is Justice Alito 
And by the way, you clerked for Roberts, right? I clerked for Roberts and Kavanaugh. Right. So, um, but the question from Alito was, what was, it was kind of what was good about the Chevron doctrine? Why did we have it? What was the reason for it? We originally yeah. put it in. And that was his first question. And it struck me as odd, because I think he's hostile to Chevron, but, but why do you think he asked that question? Or what do you think the import of that is? I, I don't know what the import of that is. And, and again, I'm not going to try to right. sort of read their minds. I do think that it is an interesting question, because I think views on Chevron have changed over time. And, you know, people who originally may have liked the doctrine, have second thoughts, people who originally were skeptical may have come around the other way. I mean, I, to me, there's sort of three things that have happened over time that I think sort of rightly inform our thinking about Chevron today. Number one, I think that statutory interpretation has changed since 1984 mm -hmm. in a good way. I think the influence of Justice Scalia, of textualism, of uh, there's sort of been a, a rollback or a pushback to the very loosey-goosey legislative history first, purpose, you know, abstract purpose of the legislature first mm -hmm. sort of mode of construction. And if you're in that world, I think you're probably right to be more skeptical about judicial overreach mm -hmm. than you would be in a world where we are today, where I think, you know, as Justice Kagan has said, we're all textualists now, um, in part because of Scalia's influence. And I think that's true with judges across the ideological and jurisprudential uh, spectrum. I think everyone is better at textualism now. Mm -hmm. So I think the two other things are, um, we've seen some, we've had experience with Chevron. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that as a practical matter, uh, people I think recognize as the reality of Chevron is, that, is the incentive that it, it creates um, for agencies. And when you're sitting there at an agency and you're told that you, you no longer have to kind of follow the best interpretation of the law, what you have to do is um, conclude that there's an ambiguity in the law and then you can kind of not do what you think yeah. is the best. You can you can just do what you think is good for policy reasons. Mm -hmm. I think that, that gives agencies too much of a blank check and we see over and over again agencies overreaching. And I think that's a negative consequence that maybe wasn't fully appreciated. Mm -hmm. And the final thing I'll say, I said this at argument, I think that one thing that got lost in the Chevron decision and in the, in the line of Chevron cases applying it uh, after the Chevron decision itself is this isn't some like free flowing issue without like law to govern like who should be the interpreter. Like you have the constitution, you also have a federal statute, the Administrative Procedure Act, that says questions of interpretation are for courts, not agencies, mm -hmm. and seems to require de novo review. Mm -hmm. And I think as, as ju judges and justices have focused more on textualism, it's become harder and harder to ignore the APA's text. And the APA kind of, I think, re basically requires de novo review. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something for Justice Scalia in particular, he was always a little bit uncomfortable with that, and he noted that in some of his statements about Chevron in the 80s. Yeah. But by the time you get to the Perez decision in 2015, he writes a, 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 a separate opinion in that case, basically saying that the APA unequivocally requires de novo review yeah. of legal questions, both when you're interpreting statutes and regulations. And so I think, I think those are three things that have sort of changed, or uh, maybe three reasons that help explain the shift in thinking. Yeah, and I think you know, one of the things, and it, it weaves into your second point, is that if you look at the contemporaneous reports on Chevron when it was passed, it wasn't when seen, it was ruled. It was ruled. Ruled. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they were in the a regulation slip of the land. There, yeah. A slip of the tongue. But when, when it was ruled on, um, nobody really saw it as a watershed moment. I think, you know, Justice. Kennedy, I, I, if I'm recalling correctly, had sort of said like, well, this is just what the law is, right? And so the idea then that, you know, the justices, at least they had the view when they ruled on Chevron was that it wasn't doing anything new, but then when it got out into the world and was being interpreted by the lower courts, it turns out it was doing a lot. And so that goes to sort of, you know, the intervening years and, and wisdom that comes as a result of percolation over time. And, and doing more and more is yeah. what I think. What I, one of the f funny things about what, what Roman just said about people changing their views is that the, the Chevron case was brought by a lawyer named Doniger, who um, still practicing, and he brought it because he didn't want, that his client didn't like the rule uh, that had been made under Chevron about um, uh, po pollution emission uh, sites. And so, uh, but he lost under Chevron that they, the Reagan administration had changed the rule and he, he had wanted it to be a, the old rule that was tighter in his view. Um, but then when we were coming up this case, he's all over the press saying, oh no, they've got to keep the Chevron doctrine. Right. So he's the guy who lost the case before and he's like, yeah, and I, boy, I'm glad I lost that case. So yeah. it is funny about change views 
And, um, and Scalia, as you pointed out, uh, there, was lo- there was some discussion about that at oral mm-hmm. argument, his change views, right? Yeah. Um, well, the other thing that I wanted to ask you about, because it got no love, I mean, I didn't even think that the Solicitor General really gave a, what we really need is Brand X. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't sense any defense of Brand X from anyone while you were up there. Well, I think Brand X is, is interesting. Now, just as a reminder for, for those of you who um, didn't read Brand X yesterday. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Brand X is a sort of subsequent follow-on case to Chevron, and it involves a situation in which uh, a court has interpreted the statute before the agency has acted. And then the agency takes a different view of the statute in a regulation. And the question is whether the agency's view um, in a situation where the, the statute, the underlying statute is ambiguous, can essentially overrule the court. And people also talk about Brand X just pointing out that agencies can reverse themselves. Yeah. But Brand X itse- itself was a case where the agency overruled the court as well. And Brand X says, yeah, you can overrule the court because the whole premise of Chevron is that when there's an ambiguity in a statute, that's essentially dele- a delegation to the agency. Mm-hmm. And so if the agency is the one that ultimately is supposed to decide what the law means in this particular case, then the fact that a court has, has ruled on it beforehand shouldn't make a difference. Mm-hmm. And I actually think like Brand X makes a, a lot of sense if, if you buy into the premise of Chevron. Mm-hmm. You know, Justice Thomas wrote the Brand X decision. Uh, he got some ribbing from his colleagues. Uh, <laughs> there the was a lot of laughter there. there yeah, on that. Say, you know, to one, one of the things Justice I, Barrett, sorry, <laughs> Justice Thomas. One right? of the many things I love about Justice Thomas is he has a sense of humor, <laughs> yeah. uh, including about himself. So he was laughing harder than anyone <laughs> when people were taking uh, taking shots at Brand X. Now he has he has since said he's he's since repented for Brand X. But but you know I think the reason that Brand X is wrong is because Chevron's wrong. Mm-hmm. If Chevron is right, if it really is a delegation to um, to, to agencies, um, then you know it, it makes a certain degree of sense to let agencies sort of overrule themselves and overrule courts. But I think it just sort of heightens the weirdness mm-hmm. of Chevron because you know in every other context we think that a statute has a fixed meaning, and the goal of interpreting a statute is to figure out what that meaning is. And we have tools of construction, we've got canons. Mm-hmm. That's what we want courts to do. That's what we want executive branch agencies to do as well when they're trying to figure out how to follow the law, find out the, what the law means, and then stay within the boundaries. And w- one of the weird things about Chevron is you have this circumstance in which it's like a feature of the doctrine. This is like a, apparently a good thing that agencies have the flexibility to essentially reinterpret federal law over and over again to match their evolving policy preferences. And so that's just another weirdness and distortion that I think Chevron introduces into, uh, into the law. And I don't, I don't, I will say there's one thing I want to comment on that. It's not even evolving because evolving um, connotes that they, they tested it against the world and one thing worked and one yeah. thing didn't and they allowed the thing that worked. But what it really is is the policy choices mm-hmm. of right. that organization, whether they worked or not. Right. Yeah, I mean, what Chevron does is it sort of takes what, what to me seems like a legal question, what does the statute mean? Mm-hmm. And it, it it says like, well, it's a, it's a hard legal question, so we're gonna basically call it a policy question. Okay. We're gonna hand it over to agencies and then the, the agencies can essentially decide this legal question based on their policy preferences which is a recipe, I think, for not following the best view of the law and to have these sort of continual mm-hmm. flip-flops. Well, yeah, and Cara, I think, I, I, I was going to say on this, this goes back to another stare decisis factor, right? The reliance in- interest. Is Chevron, I think, you know, I think both you and Paul formulate this way. It's like a reliance-killing doctrine. If I'm a regulated entity or an individual, I can, in theory, discern what the law is today, but I can't discern what the law is two, three, four years from now, if the agency under Chevron is wholly permitted to do a 180, and then four years after that, another 180. And so- And Congress does nothing. And Congress does nothing. Congress hasn't changed it. The statute's exactly the same. It's been the same for decades. Um, And so again, also to your point is like, there's been no sort of change in the way we view things or development technology. It's just- the, the vacillations between you know, political parties or, or agency heads, however you want to perceive it. Carrie, you also brought up Justice Barrett and I, uh, about, she asked a question about Brand X. Um, I'm going to ask you first and I'll go to, uh, but Barrett is obviously uh, Sphinx-like uh-huh. compared to, uh, I'm pretty sure I know where Gorsuch and Kagan <laughs> yeah. are on this. Um, but uh, but she, she uh, I think I've said before that um, she keeps her cards close to the vest, you don't even know she's playing mm-hmm. poker, but but what, what did you make of her question? You know, to 
to your point, when I went back and looked at the transcript, there's one question that she, she draws out, and I think it was in the Loper Bright argument, and it's the Solicitor General, and she says something to the effect of like, well, aren't implicit delegations, which is an issue here, right? You know, you can have an explicit delegation, agency go do X, versus if we read between the lines, you get an implicit delegation. Well, aren't implicit delegations sometimes just the byproduct of the limitations of language? And it was a very short question that was sort of lost in the all, but it, it told me a lot, at least how she's looking at some of these concerns between implicit, explicit, and what the statute actually says. I mean, that was a very sort of, for a short question, had a lot baked into it. Yeah, I, I think that that line of questioning was, was very interesting and, mm -hmm. and potentially important about, and sort of signaling where Justice Barrett might, how she might be thinking about it. And I think what she was sort of suggesting in the question is that if you have ambiguities in statutes that are essentially accidents, you know, she, she brought up a criminal case that's on the court's docket that I think involves the imprecise use of and instead of or, or, mm -hmm. or instead of and, like something that Congress really, it, it, there's nothing intentional about like a mistake or an ambiguity that way, or maybe they misplaced a comma was another example she gave. Mm -hmm. That it really, do, the implication of her question seemed to be that it really doesn't make a lot of sense to interpret an ambiguity like that as being some sort of implied delegation mm -hmm. to the agency to make policy. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the Chevron doctrine uh, doesn't distinguish between mm -hmm. different types of ambiguities. It basically says if it's ambiguous, the agency gets to decide. And I think one of the challenges, and my, my friend and, and former colleague Elizabeth Prelogger, the Solicitor General, I think did a very uh, excellent job in defending a very flawed doctrine. But she was, she was very, uh, very strong, but I think one of the challenges in her position is that that f to defend Chevron on its own terms, you have to defend you know essentially a very broad doctrine, mm -hmm. and the justifications that are put forward about expertise or delegation, they're questionable even in the best case. But in a lot of cases, if the ambiguity is unintentional, mm -hmm. then how can it be that that's an intentional delegation? That doesn't make a lot of sense to you know to the agency. And if you think that Chevron is about valuing agency expertise. Why do you give Chevron deference in cases where agency expertise is just not in play? Like, like this case. one. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, in this case, essentially what happened is the agency ran out of money and it decided it wanted to keep the monitors on the boat. And so it basically imposed what's a de facto tax on the industry mm -hmm. to pay for the monitors because they ran out of money. I mean, what are they expert in? The fact that they ran out of money. Like that's so, not, they like, can't some, possibly. Some people would tell you the government is expert in running out of money. But, you know, <laughs> exactly. That's not the question for the court. And, and, and you know, and I think, the, I think the government, the Solicitor General's brief, you know, they basically sort of tried to say, yeah, yeah, this, this counts as our expertise because they kind of had to say that. Mm -hmm. But if this counts as expertise, then the expertise rationale really doesn't mean very much. And it, everything will be expertise if you keep this rule, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They're always going to say that. Right. So I have uh, the, the ne I'm going to tell you what my next two question is. So you, you answer one at a time. The justices gonna, don't do that. I, I know, that. I know, so I know. Think ahead. But uh, <laughs> so I'm first going to ask, what do you think is the hardest question you got asked? And then I'm going to ask, um, what what do you think the hardest question for the government was? And I'll I'll ask you both that. So first, Roman, what was your hardest question? You know, I think there are a lot of tricky questions in the case. I think one question that I think is, is something that it's not intuitively obvious when you think about this problem, um, but I think it bears on the stare decisis issue is, what do you do if, if the court were to overturn Chevron, what do you do with the fact that it's been out there for decades and you have a lot of uh, decisions out there, decisions of the Supreme Court and the lower courts that have applied it? Um, are are, is a, con a necessary consequence of overruling Chevron that essentially all of those decisions in individual cases involving individual regulations go out the window because the methodology has been overruled. And that's a tricky kind of interpretive question to think about. I think we came to the right answer in our briefs and, and you know, we were able to articulate it and Paul Clement was able to articulate it as well as argument. And our basic view was that, look, you know, the way the court thinks about stare decisis and precedent Stare decisis typically applies both to the bottom line holding in the individual case and to the chain of reasoning that leads to that bottom line holding. And we would say that even if a, a step in the chain of reasoning leading to the bottom line holding, even if the Chevron sort of analysis is overturned and it's no longer good law, the bottom line holding in those other cases is still, uh, you know, has, still has stare decisis effect. And so we would say that if we were to win the case, that this would not automatically mean 
that all of the dozens of cases that the Supreme Court has decided applying Chevron or that the lower courts have decided applying Chevron are like automatically out the window. Now, people could still challenge them, yeah. but they would have to surmount the usual stare decisis sort of factors as to the bottom line holding in those cases. And I think that's a tricky issue. It was important to a number of the justices. Justice Barrett asked the Petitioner's Council in both mm -hmm. cases about it. And I think hopefully um, our answer, I think, is both <laughs> correct, but also can give some reassurance to, to people who think that if they do the right thing and overturn Chevron, maybe it's going to be disruptive with respect to those past decisions. Now, what I mean, would you think I the mean, hardest was? I, I think that was. I mean, I, I think it was a, there's always concerns about what are the secondary tertiary effects of this. I mean, you know, you can even go back to when Chevron was originally passed. Or, I see it did it again. <laughs> when they originally ruled on Chevron, they thought there'd be no secondary or tertiary effects and look where we are. And so I do think that the court has serious concerns about them, but I do think that we we found, you know, the path forward. Yeah, the, the court is not, I won't use the Latin, but they are not uh, do justice, though the heavens fall. That's mm -hmm. really not the starry decisis view that they have. Mm -hmm. um, so my next question is, what did you think was the hardest question for the government? So I think that a very hard issue for the government that we tried to exploit in our briefs and that I was very happy to see the justices bothered by it as well is, um, you know, the defense of Chevron, the, the intellectually coherent defense of Chevron, I think, goes something along the lines of, like, at a certain point, a law is ambiguous. A court cannot do its normal function of interpreting the law because the law runs out. And really, there's just all that's left is a policy decision. And then the question is, well, who do you want to make the policy decision, a court or an expert agency that sort of does policy every day? And if you think about the issue in those terms, it starts to make more sense that if you really had a policy question, you would want an agency to do it, and you'd be a little worried about having judges do it. And our point in response is, well, actually, the law doesn't run out because it's a question of law. It's a statutory interpretation mm -hmm. question. And I think that the sort of way of framing the issue that seemed to resonate um, and that, that the Solicitor General was asked about by multiple justices was, well, imagine that you get the same statutory question that arises before the agency acts. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a statute involving- well, when the agency, agency isn't the party. Maybe the agency is not the party, but, but maybe the agency, even if the agency um, is a party in that case, maybe they haven't issued a regulation that gets mm -hmm. Chevron deference, right? And so in those cases, if the court has to interpret the statute on its own without any agency guidance, the court would, in those cases, would not say, oh, we've, we've reached an ambiguity, the law has run out, like I'm unable to decide this question. And if they did decide it, they wouldn't say, oh, I ceased becoming a court doing law, I started becoming a policymaker doing policy. And if that's true, then it can't be the case that just because the agency later issues a regulation that that same question somehow turns into a policy question just because the agency has acted. And I think this is a kind of internal contradiction in the SG's position, and they were asked a number of times, Alito, I think Kavanaugh, maybe Gorsuch, sort of asked about like, well, how, you know, why can't courts decide these questions if they decide them all the time mm -hmm. when the agency hasn't acted? And I'm not sure there was a great answer to that. And Kavanaugh put it very well, as I, I, as I recall. I mean, he, he, really, he really bored down and said it as clearly as you could. Kara, what did you think? I thought the hardest question uh, they gave to the Solicitor General was, uh, Justice Alito asking, what is an ambiguity? Like, define what this is. Right. And, you know, I mean, her, her response is driven by case law and what the court has said in the past. And it, it doesn't add any clarity, right? There's no sort of bright line for how much, amb and I think some of the other justices pulled on this, how much amb ambiguity is enough? Is it, you know, like a little, like a scintilla of it? Do you have to have a lot of ambiguity? And that goes back to, again, like the workability is, you can't figure out where the line is and back to even, you know, what I was saying with, you know, what Judge Kethledge had said and his critique of this is that, well, you just, it, it sort of forces you or, or gives you the easy out in some ways and that you just don't have to decide if it is truly ambiguous. And I thought, I, those are both good ones. I think because, I think what General Preligard did was give them their own answer what ambiguity was, <laughs> yeah. I think. Right, she yeah. had, I did not hear an answer to the question, why can we find, why doesn't the law run out when we're doing these statutes where the um, agency hasn't acted or the agency isn't involved, but we, the law runs out when the agency is involved? And I told the Federalist Society, I, I think that it, it injures the dignity of an Article III court, and, and particularly the Supreme Court, which is a constitutional body, 
to run over to a low-level bureaucrat and say, the law ran out. I'm doing interpretation. Can I borrow a couple law? <laughs> and I, I, I think that that is not a good look for the judiciary. And I, I didn't hear any answer. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that one because the ambiguity answer wasn't great, but it is what the court said before. Right. Yeah, so well, it's really right. not her I mean, fault. Yeah, but I think that part of the reason you're in front of the court now is because the court's previous definitions of ambiguity just aren't working. And I think Justice Gorsuch later on made a quip or something to the effect of like ambiguous ambiguity. I mean, that's right. sort of the, un, again, like unworkable um, sort of undefined points yeah, on this. And I think that's right. And, and I don't blame the Solicitor I actually thought that the Solicitor General gave as good an answer as could be given yeah. on that yeah. question. Yeah. The problem with the ambiguity about ambiguity is that it leads to a situation, Justice Kavanaugh has written about this, where the two, two judges can think the exact same thing about the law. They could mm-hmm. think, you know, interpretation X is 60% likely to be right. Interpretation is Y, 40% likely to be right. If it were just up to me and there were no agency, I'd go with X instead of Y. But then because they're not sure exactly how ambiguous or how clear the law has to be, it might change. One of the judges might defer to the agency and choose why. The other one might not. And so you have like this threshold question about ambiguity that drives the result in the case, even though both judges agree on like the, what the better view of the law is. This, this is your Kethledge Silberman? Yeah, exactly. The Kethledge Silberman situation. And, and those are both, you know, both terrific judges. Mm-hmm. Um, Judge uh, Judge Silverman, no longer with us, of course, but was an amazing judge for so many years. And these are serious judges. And they kind of, you know, they're both being candid and they're both trying to apply the doctrine. Um, and they and they are they probably agree on the bottom line, what's the better interpretation, mm-hmm. but they disagree about wh- what ambiguity means. And then, you know, just inserting that ambiguity question as a threshold question in every case just focuses all the court's effort on, is it ambiguous enough? And then they're not actually thinking about the thing that matters, which is what's the best view of the law, mm-hmm. which is how they'd approach any other legal question. So one, one name we haven't uh, brought up is Sotomayor. And she was um, a very active questioner. And I think that she's very pro-Chevron. But her questions, it appeared to me, went a lot to, um, to expertise. Yeah, a lot to it. But what, what was your impression of her questions? I just want to. Now I think we've gone through everyone. That's the one I've missed. No, I think that's right. I mean, I think she was defending Chevron on expertise grounds, echoing a lot of the points that uh, others were making. Justice Kagan, in particular, I think she also cared about stare decisis and was trying to use that as a reason to be skeptical about overturning the doctrine. You know, the one thing that she said at one point in the argument that I thought was interesting was she was talking about sort of ambiguity and how it's, you know, reasonable people can disagree. Mm -hmm. And she sort of gave the example of the fact that the court gets hard questions, statutory questions all the time and rules five to four. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like the implication of that being that, you know, these things are just endemic in the Mm -hmm. law. They happen all the time. And I think the problem with that view, as I pointed out, I tried to point out at the argument, is that, you know, if the test for ambiguity is whether like justices of the court would disagree about the question, then you're going to have a huge number of cases that are going to be treated as ambiguous under step one and therefore are going to lead to Chevron deference under step two. And this doctrine is going to be extremely broad. And I thought it was interesting that Justice Kagan sort of jumped in um, after that exchange with Sotomayor on that topic to kind of say, well, no one really thinks that's what Chevron means. Because she, mm-hmm. Justice Kagan was trying to push a view of Chevron that's uh, narrower and they're, mm-hmm. therefore more defensible. But I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, and I, I think it explains. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's another way of sort of now that you say it, I recall it, but I, 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 yeah, uh, question the fact that people have different threshold views of what counts as ambiguous. Yeah, and I think you know if the way she was framing it on that point, and I, I sort of heard the same thing was, well, is best just what a majority of this court says is the best reading of the law, as opposed to, and I think in in that question is this idea of like, well, the agencies bring expertise mm-hmm. and other information and. Maybe they do have the best read because they have experience. I mean, I, I sort of saw a benefit of the doubt aspect going towards the agencies in, in her questions. Can I just jump in on that? Because I yeah. think that was another thing that we haven't talked a ton about. Yeah. Is that it's not like our, our position is that courts should ignore agencies mm-hmm. when they're saying what they think the law means or saying what they think the best I'll use the word is. Skidmore. Right. So Skidmore came up a lot. And so Skidmore is a different doctrine. Um, that that sort of is false is very different from Chevron in the sense that it doesn't require a court to accept the agency's interpretation if the court doesn't believe that interpretation is right, but it does require the court to 
give very serious consideration and, and give weight to the agency's uh, thinking on the issue. And so what we tried to tell the justices in response to a number of questions from, from all sides of the court yeah. was that you know if you overturn Chevron, you're still gonna have this concept of um, Skidmore. We probably call it Skidmore weight instead of Skidmore deference to avoid any, any uh, confusion about what we're saying. But basically, like, even, in, even without Chevron, courts are going to be considering what agencies are saying. And a lot of times agencies are going to have a lot of smart things to say because they're going to have been present at the creation, maybe when the statute was enacted. Maybe they helped draft the statute. And they're going to have experience with implementing it over the years. And if they have had a consistent view of how the statute operates and that's how it's worked, that's going to be important information for the court to have as it makes its decision about what the best interpretation of the law is. And the only real difference between Skidmore and Chevron is that at the end of the day, um, the agency wins in a world in which Skidmore is being applied only if the court is ultimately persuaded by what the agency has to say. And I would just submit that if the agency really has this expertise that's relevant to the legal question, it's gonna be able to articulate that expertise, and if the court's persuaded, the agency is gonna win. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's great, because that's what the law is. Mm -hmm. But, but it's, what's not gonna happen is if the agency is unpersuasive, mm -hmm. Under Chevron, the agency might still win, and thats I don't think that's an appropriate sort of way to resolve the case. But that's really the difference between Skidmore and Chevron, and I think that was sort of uh, another point of reassurance maybe that our side was able to give to the justices that, you know, agencies are still going to matter if we win this case. And I want to I wanna tell, you know, if you take administrative law and you're in mm -hmm. law school, they teach Skidmore in the deference portion of mm -hmm. administrative law. But if you're in Roman's position and you use Skidmore deference, you're going to get a fight between Kavanaugh <laughs> and, and Gorsuch. Uh, wait a minute, is it a deference doctrine? Well, it, it, it is a, doc, a doctrine of respect. Let's put it that mm -hmm. way. Exactly. If you, if, you, if you ever get up there. But in, in any event, um, so, uh, so that's, that's the, the question that you also answered, I think, Thomas's first question was, does Article Three, because we press the constitutional argument more than the APA, if you compare Loper's briefs and our briefs. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted to know if Article Three required getting rid of all deference, like in habeas, for right. instance. And that was not our position. But I thought, I thought that he was satisfied with the Skidmore answer. Yeah, and I think you know, our position is that is ultimately that when the task at hand is, is saying what the law means, mm. that deference is inappropriate. Now, there are gonna be other contexts in which courts might have to weigh in on whether to grant certain remedies like habeas or mandamus, mm. where there may be limits on what a court can do mm. um, that require it you know, essentially to not interfere with a decision of, that another decision maker has made, um, even though the court disagrees with it. But that's different because the court's not saying that the law means X, even though the court thinks the law means Y. It's just applying a, a different doctrine that essentially limits its remedial power. So in habeas, if you have a state conviction that has gotten full review in the state system and then someone goes to federal court, the law says that a federal judge can only grant habeas relief to a state prisoner if the conviction you know, violates clearly established law. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a higher threshold for giving a remedy. Um, and in mandamus, very similar. Um, you know, plain error review. If you don't preserve your objection in a criminal trial in the district court, then sometimes you can get an appellate court to look at that issue if the error is plain. But if it's not plain, then even if you might be right, you know, you waived it, you, you forfeited the objection, you can't bring it up. So there are other contexts in the law in which courts are, are gonna let stand certain actions that, that maybe, you know, were mistakes. But that's because there's, there are essentially limits on remedies, not um, not deference mm -hmm. doctrines that, that essentially subcontract out mm -hmm. the authority to say what the law actually means. And I, I want to ask Kara this because you know the uh, Magnuson Stevens Act very <laughs> well, because I think it does point out something. Mm -hmm. um, even without Chevron, the Secretary of Commerce has so many things he may do. There's like shalls mm -hmm. and there's mays. How many mays are there? It's a lot of mays. No, you know, I think one of the things that overarches the entire MSA is there's a series of national standards, which is Congress saying, these are the things that we care about and we want you agency to care about as you're going about and protecting our very important resource of fisheries. And you know, it is things like, how does the regulation impact the community associated with the fishing? And we talk about this all the time and our client she, you, she said it very clearly. She goes, she knows the guys on the boat. She knows their families. 
you know, she knows the people in town because they're all involved in fishing. I said, I grew up, I grew up in a coastal area. Fishing communities are tightly knit communities. And so this idea that Congress explicitly said, you need to consider that, consider that impact. And then, you know, does the agency actually do it? I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's up in the air, but there are a handful of these, um, you know, preservation of the species Eight is of one them. of them. Eight of them, yeah, <laughs> handful. <laughs> Your hands so, might be slightly larger than mine. I don't so, know. <laughs> so, uh, exactly. So, all of these statutes, and I think that the court knows it, so it didn't come up mm. as much, but they give, and actually, Kavanaugh asked you a question. They can say, you can take 50 fi fish out of the water, or you can say, the agency shall determine how many fish can come out. And that's mm. how the MSA is written. Mm -hmm. It's how many, the agency can determine how many fish come out. Yeah, and I think this point, um, which speaks to a broader point, which is that, um, Getting rid of Chevron doesn't mean that that delegations are improper. Mm. Uh, there may be other constraints on delegations right. from other parts of the Constitution, Article One, the non-delegation doctrine. But from Chevron, from the perspective of, of Chevron, like Chevron doesn't have a problem, uh, or sorry, the, the the arguments that we're making do not forbid an agency in an appropriate way for delegating expressly. Uh, the, the Congress delegating expressly to the agency to make judgments. And it can mm -hmm. use language that's broad and that confers discretion. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's been important for Justice Kavanaugh back to when he was on the D.C. Circuit, mm -hmm. where he actually was relatively deferential to agencies when he understood them to be operating within a zone of their like legitimately mm -hmm. expressly conferred discretion. And so I think one of the things that came up, the Chief Justice asked a question about this, Kavanaugh, some others, is they wanted some reassurance and confirmation that getting rid of Chevron would not itself make it impossible for Congress to actually give mm -hmm. some zone of discretion to agencies to act. I thought that was important to them. Mm -hmm. So the, that, and it's one of the things that's always struck me about Chevron is that the more expertise an agency uses, they're, they're probably gonna get the most deference. If, if, the, if the Nuclear Power Regulatory Commission says there's this many Rotkins or whatever can go into your body, there's not a, some liberal arts educated judge who's gonna say, no, you can't do that. It's the closer you stay to, yeah. here's the fish counts, here's the expertise, it strikes me that that's the more likely to win at, yeah. rather than this, where we say we're experts at everything, give us deference on everything. Well, I mean, that, and in the fisheries context, here's an example of saying, well, this year we're gonna, close the season at X metric tons. Like, I, I don't think a court's ever gonna go back and pull up the numbers and say, no, 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 oh, you got the X numbers plus right. five. And so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that agency expertise goes out the window. And I think that there are some folks who have at least made that assumption. I think there's still room for it, but it's gonna be tied to what is the agency actually doing? What is the question they're answering? What's the authority or power that they're allegedly acting on. And under. what did Congress say in the statute yeah. about But when you've got a legal question, then yeah. that's for the court to decide. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if the facts inform the answer to the legal question, then I think Skidmore takes care of that mm -hmm. and lets courts consider what the agencies have to say about the facts. And if the question ultimately really is a policy or a fact mm -hmm. question, then the agencies are going to get um, a more you know deferential type of review under State Farm or mm -hmm. under sub the substantial evidence test. Um, and so they're going to still have considerable leeway to act. All right. And uh, well, you were with the client. How did the client feel after the argument? Uh, she was ecstatic. I mean, I think for for those at home and in the room, you know, this rule was originally sort of began somewhere in 2013, started taking shape in 2015 is when the client started you know, speaking out against it. So this is a decade in the making. I mean, four years in litigation, but much longer. And I think, you know, she made the point um, you know, on the outside of the Supreme Court says equal justice under law, right? And that the problem with Chevron is when you walk into court and if the agency invokes it and they get to step two, you lose 90% of the time. That's not equal justice under the law. And I think that for the first time, she's before a court that isn't necessary. They're, they're questioning Chevron, right? They're talking about Chevron, how it's gonna apply as opposed to the lower courts, which under precedent are compelled to apply Chevron. And so I think this was, despite being in court for four years, the first time I, I think that there is a view of a fair hearing on the issue. I think that's right. And, uh, and, 
And I think if you go and look at this, I thought this was very high level argument, mm -hmm. certainly by Roman, uh, also by Paul, and also by the by the um, Solicitor General. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was all. The other thing that struck me, and um, before I go to final questions, I, you know, I've been there a number of times. They all seemed in a good mood. Yeah. Like, <laughs> didn't it seem like what? I, I was wondering about that because at one point, um, I think Sotomayor leaned into to, uh, to uh, Justice Thomas about Brand X, and then Gorsuch gets in, and then they all laugh uproariously. Yeah. And I, I mean, they just seemed to, um, they were serious, but it, for some reason, they all seemed up uh, that day. Yeah, and, and I think, look, I mean, I think there's a lot we see in the press these days about the court dealing with hard, hard issues. And I think people, especially the press that doesn't fully understand, members of the press that don't fully understand the court, they think that because there are a lot of hard decisions that the justices don't like each other, don't get along, aren't mm -hmm. collegial. And I just don't think that's right. I mean, I think they mm -hmm. frankly all approach their job with a lot of seriousness of purpose and they, and they have strong views about the law, but they also have mutual respect for one another. Um, and this was a case where it was, it was fun to argue because you felt like you were there, um, part of a conversation with them on a very serious topic, but one in which, you know, there were, there was, there were robust views that were reasonable on all sides and sort of talking through all these views, I think was, was important and valuable. And I think the justices hopefully enjoyed it. I don't know if they wanted three hours and 40 minutes, if they had, <laughs> maybe they could have, uh, they could have, uh, you know, at, at, at the outset, maybe, uh, maybe they would have preferred something shorter. Uh, by the end of it, I feel like they were ready for lunch. Uh, so was I. Um, but uh, but but I think they got a they got they got their their money's worth that day. And I'll the just advocates I'll just add sides. I'll just add to what Roman said about this is that the reason they took our case really I joke that it was my great uh, cert <laughs> petition but it wasn't it was because uh, Justice Jackson was recused from the other case and that shows respect for other people on the court. So everything here really I I thought belied this idea that there's all these problems because I I have really never seen. Um, uh, a, a court so in sync, even when they were disagreeing about things, they weren't disagreeable. And I, mm -hmm. and I, and I think for uh, certainly any of you law students, it's an important lesson to take back. So um, let me, uh, I, I know lawyers hate this, but I'm going to do one. So I will, uh, I, I, I will ask you to predict. And if you have, uh, if you cannot do that for um, <laughs> reasons of uh, client concerns or anything, that's what I usually say. I never predict. Mm -hmm. But on this one, I'm going to do it. But I'll give you an opportunity. How do you, th how do you think it, it looked after you argued? Um, well, I was glad that they gave us a good hearing. I will make a very firm prediction, uh, which is we'll get a decision in June. Um, <laughs> there will be a dissent. Um, it will be well argued on both sides. And I'm hopeful that we'll prevail, but we'll have to see what they do. Well, you know, I'm just going to go with after sitting in the room that day, you know, I'm hopeful. I'm not going to sort of predict what it may be or what the contours of it are. Um, but I do think that moving forward, when people are bringing challenges to agency action, it's going to be on a fairer playing field as a result of this case. Uh, well, I certainly can't disagree with Roman, but I will, um, I, I will make a prediction. I think, I think that Roberts is going to write it, and I think they're, it, Chevron is, is going to be either gone or unrecognizable. Um, and the reason I say I think Roberts is going to write it is I think he doesn't want Gorsuch writing. <laughs> so that is, that, is my, that is my prediction. Um, but I want, before we close out, I'd like if you have any final thoughts before we go to questions about the case or about arguing that day or any other uh, part of this, I'd like to give you an opportunity to close out. Yeah, no, I'll just say, you know, one of the things that was super interesting about the case was the fact that it was really to some extent, you felt like you were going back to law school. Very mm -hmm. academic, very theoretical, very interesting. And I kind of love that stuff. And the, the back and forth with the justices sort of, you know, bore that out. Mm -hmm. um, but there's another side of the case, which is there's a human story behind it. And mm -hmm. we saw one human story affected by Chevron with our clients and with, with the cause of action clients. Right. Um, I think the same yeah. issues, the same, you know, kinds of stories are out there in other cases where Chevron applies. And I think one of the fun things for me was coming out of the argument and getting to spend a little bit more time with the client and hear from them sort of how they experience this abstruse, like theoretical doctrine in their daily lives in trying to go out and make a living and, and earn some money in, in their small business. And so I, it sort of reminded me how important it is to, you know, how the law really does affect um, ordinary citizens, even these sort of th theoretical and academic issues of law and how important it is to have uh, citizens and businesses who are willing to stand up when 
you know, the law is not being applied in a fair way and are willing to go to court and get help from folks like NCLA and others in helping helping them vindicate their rights. And so I thought that was a nice reminder of, of sort of the human dimension of the case. And I really enjoyed uh, that aspect of uh, last Wednesday. Well, glad you came. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll say, you know, I uh, when I took administrative law many years ago now, but I remember when we taught, they were taught Chevron, I just raised my hand, asked my professor, and said, this doesn't make any sense. And so, you know, years later to sort of be at the core, be beside our client, you know, <laughs> making the argument of this doesn't make any sense um, to some extent is is sort of just this tremendous experience. And I think, um, I know our client was deeply grateful and grateful to Ramon and, and, and John for their years and, you know, last few weeks of very hard work. So it was an exciting day. All right. And I think now we'll take questions. Do you think that it might also be a fractured opinion in the sense that it may overrule, uh, may have limited, or we see something like Rapanos, where we're going to say, what's a water to the United States and litigate this again for 10 years? And the second question, if I may, is this whole issue about ambiguity. Uh, the courts, you know, they look at the statutes as ambiguous. The agencies are the experts supposedly to define it. But what if Congress intentionally made it ambiguous because they didn't want to take the hard choice and tell their constituents that they passed a law on something and they said, oh, the court ruled on that, so don't blame me as the lawmaker how it came out. So in those kind of cases, should the court remand it back to Congress and say, do your job and make clear what you meant the first time? So I'm gonna take that question since I was the one who made the prediction. Um, I, I will say this, Paul. I, I think we're gonna get a good opinion. I do not, I cannot, it's bad enough I made a prediction in my case. It, it would be even worse if I were to say, oh, it'll be, you know, 7-2 or whatever, and they're going to Kaiserize it. I have no idea. Um, but what I do think, um, to your point, is the argument that Roman and, 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 and Paul Clement made, when the law runs out, if there's amb if ambiguity, then the, then the Congress didn't give them the power, I think is going to be the answer. Mm -hmm. That's that non-delegation. Uh, I, I suppose so, but it isn't straight non-delegation in that, oh, Congress can't do that if it wants to. It's that it didn't do it in this aspect. It isn't, it isn't what we normally uh, say is, you know, a Gundy-type non-delegation. It's just they didn't do anything, so they didn't even try to delegate. It's kind of how I think it, it'll work out. Uh, on the second part of your question, I think, you know, my, view, my personal view is that most, uh, del uh, most ambiguities are, are mm -hmm. completely unintentional. Um, and they have to do with the limits of language, the failure, the inability to foresee future things that come up. And so I think in those cases, it really makes no sense. The Chevron principle makes no sense. Mm -hmm. I think in some cir circumstances, you might have sort of, um, you know, deliberate ambiguity or vagueness to get past a hard mm -hmm. negotiation or something. I think it's, it's in, in, in some cases, maybe it's you want to leave an issue open for the agency, I think those, that last category of cases is maybe the ones in which you're gonna to start to run into Article I non-delegation problems, because those are the cases where essentially Congress doesn't have an intelligible principle of how it wants the ambiguity resolved, and it's just trying to like clip, kick the can down the road for someone else to decide. And mm -hmm. so that might raise problems under other doctrines. But to me, most of the ambiguities are unintentional, and so you can't have a doctrine that's triggered by unintentional ambiguities, and we're gonna pretend that that is a, a, a real life equivalent to an express delegation to an agency. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, next question. A fantastic job both on the briefs and at the oral argument. So thank you very much uh, on, on behalf of NCLA and our clients. Uh, and then I wanted to, to let people know if, if they wanna uh, see Megan Lapp and, and our, our clients, there's a video uh, on NCLA's website at nclalegal.org, look for the for the relentless case under the litigation uh, tab or ca cases tab, you can watch that video. Uh, uh, or if if you just want to see you know a more fictionalized account of it, uh, take a look at the movie Coda uh, that won Best Picture here a couple of years ago. It tells the story of of a fishing uh, a fishing family, and this regulation is actually one of the things that comes up. It's kind of a uh, a subplot in the in the movie, but uh, you can see. Uh, why having monitors on boats and having to pay for it is something that it even made it into an Oscar-winning film. So it, this is a this is a big deal uh, on, on the facts as well. Uh, but but my question, uh, uh, Roman, for you is: uh, Is there another 
kind of deference that you think, depending on what happens here, that the court would be naturally looking at next? Would it be maybe City of Arlington uh, deference about the scope of, of agency's jurisdiction? Or could, could it be, even if they overturn Chevron, that it, they sort of leave Kaiser and everything else uh, as is? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, I kind of tend to think that if they if they were to overturn Chevron here, they would probably want to um, they would probably do it in a way that would, at a minimum, leave significant clues and breadcrumbs as to like what what should happen with some of those other doctrines. The most obvious one is our deference, um, and so you know the court could totally separate that out and say Kaiser the Kaiser decision our deference is totally not affected by this decision. Um, it could say things in this decision, if we were to prevail, that would have implications for those other doctrines. I don't know. Um, and so, you know, in the Kaiser decision itself, the Chief Justice was very clear that he did not believe that the star decisis holding in that case had application in the Chevron context. We hope that's a breadcrumb. Um, we hope that's a breadcrumb uh, and that would bode well for us here. But I wonder if there would be something similar in this, in this case about that. Uh, you know, a lot could depend on what ground, if we were to prevail, what, what ground we win on. You know, is it that these delegations are fictional? Is it that the Constitution forbids this? Is it that the APA forbids this? So we'll just have to we'll just have to see. Next question. I'm assuming that uh, if your side prevails in the case, that uh, there'll be a lot of people in Congress who are not happy. And <clears throat> excuse me, what would be your feeling if Congress then passed a law saying? we hereby adopt Chevron, but they don't then go change the underlying Herring statute. So the, the statute is still the same. Uh, would it be unconstitutional for courts at that point to enforce the new statute and say we are giving this uh, Chevron 2 deference? Yeah, so on that, I got a question essentially along those lines from Justice Kagan. And I think our view would be, our view is that, that if you pass a statute that essentially takes the interpretive function away from Article III courts and gives that interpretive function over to agencies, that what you've done is you've, you've reallocated the constitutional separation of powers. You've reallocated a core judicial power and given it to an agency. And, and Congress obviously can't take away another branch's power and give it to a, uh, a, a third branch. And so we would say that that is unconstitutional. I mean, I think if Congress wanted to legislate, they could do other types of statutes that maybe could have a similar effect, at least in some cases. Um, but I don't think they could codify Chevron uh, in our view. And I think even if they did with respect to the MSA, I don't think it would matter because I think that you know, our view of the statute is right. And hopefully it would be right un even, under, even under Chevron. And I do wanna say, you know, one of the things that we've learned from states who have rejected Chevron or Chevron-like deference is that the opposite isn't true, is that we've seen either through constitutional amendments at the state level or legislative enactments saying you will not defer to the agency. And I think that that would actually be permissible because it is respecting the separation of powers. Um, we've, again, we've certainly seen that in, in some of the states that have rejected Chevron-type deference. Yeah, and that is an issue that uh, Paul Kaminar's question touches on, which we don't know, is, is the court going to strike down the final rule which started this whole thing? Uh, and, and I didn't even predict it. I don't know. We have, both sides have asked, and I didn't bring this up, and, but we both asked them that if you, if, whatever you do to Chevron, then you've got to get to the final rule because, you know, have some pity on the poor appellate don't and district us. courts and show us how it's done in the, in the same case that you, you make the new, new doctrine mm -hmm. or rule in. Any other? Clyde? Yeah. We have a couple of questions coming in from people online. Uh, Richard asks about the line, this question earlier about making policy versus interpreting law. And what Richard wants to know is, well, isn't there also a line between the agency making policy and Congress making law? Yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and aren't, we, aren't we really, you know, doesn't, doesn't this really uh, implicate both of those, both of those lines? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. I think with respect to the Chevron case or cases and the issues that we've been talking about, the core di distinction is really between the judicial power and then the political branches. And for purposes of this case, what we're really talking about is a threat to um, the Article Three judicial duty to exercise independent judgment. 
it doesn't matter as much whether the interpretive authority, you know, how, you know, whether that authority is properly delegated from Congress to the executive. The point is it belongs to the courts and that's what courts should do. I think there are very significant and weighty constitutional questions about the extent to which Congress can delegate its own legislative power to agencies. And I think in a lot of cases, you know, it seems like agencies are exercising too much you know, lawmaking type power and then the delegations are too broad. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, that the court is likely to get into those issues in this particular case, although I do think it's an important sort of part of the overall context. No, I agree with that. And Saul wants to know, uh, we, we've talked a lot about how great it will be to overrule Chevron, but, but looking at it objectively, can you think of anything from our perspective that would be a negative or a negative, an adverse consequence of voiding Chevron and getting rid? It, it, are there problems we would then face that we haven't talked about? So I, I, I'll just, Kagan says what they are. There's, there's remember I, I said, and, and Ramon has said that people switch sides mm -hmm. when something happens? Because I don't think anyone really attacks the idea that the first, when a law comes out, the first administrative interpretations of that law, particularly if they helped mm -hmm. with it, um, th there is going, some different political parties, ox are going to be gored, mm -hmm. depending on what the precedent is. As Roman was saying, there's precedent out there that this regulation is okay under this statute. It's probably going to get stare decisis effect. Well, it's like if you played musical chairs and you stop the music, when the Chevron's done, the music is done for the administrative agencies and everyone's going to stay in their chairs and have to follow the law. I think politically that'll hurt some people sometime and some people the other, but it will, everyone will know what the law is or have a better understanding than they have now when they stop the music every time a, um, an administration changes. Yeah, and I think related to that, you know, it, from a policy perspective, I think that cleaning up the interpretive method issue in this case could have good effects or bad effects, depending on what your policy views are, because yeah. sometimes maybe an, an agency is going to be doing something you like, or sometimes an agency is going to be deregulating, and it might be harder to deregulate in certain cases where the best view of the law is that the, the agency's original position in favor of regulation was yeah. right. And so, you know, when I look at that, I don't think that that should drive the analysis because I think statutory interpretation and the role of courts should not depend on your policy views. And I think the, 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 the way to have to faithfully interpret the law is to choose the best interpretation of the law. And as Justice Scalia said, that's not always going to be the interpretation that you might favor as a policy matter. And so I think some people inevitably are going to be um, disappointed with the application of a no Chevron rule. And some people are going to be happy. And then on other issues, it might flip. But I think from my perspective, the thing that's important uh, under the Constitution is to get the judicial power right and to get the separation of powers right and to get the make sure that the procedures that are set forth in the Constitution are followed. And hopefully that will lead to great outcomes. Um, but, you know, in some cases, individual cases, maybe uh, maybe Chevron would favor some policy position that I like. But, but that's not a reason to mm -hmm. distort the interpretive process or the separation of powers. And I think that that is going to be our last question. We'll end on that. I want to echo Mark Chenoweth's comment to go to NCLA legal.org and take a look at the case. Uh, we have a lot of material there in case you have any further questions. Um, and on behalf of the New Civil Liberties Alliance and our esteemed panel, uh, I want to thank you all for attending this luncheon law event entitled, Can Relentless and Loper Bright Kill Chevron Deference? The answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> join us Bold. <laughs> at our next luncheon law on February 29th for a discussion of another of our cases before the Supreme Court, Cargill versus Garland. Uh, you may know that the case as the bump stock ban, where the ATF decided to usurp the role of Congress and pass its own law declaring uh, bump stops to be machine guns. It's another administrative law case, and uh, it's going to be argued in February, and we'll be back for that. Thank you. <laughs>